Brian Hartman joins me today as we continue our series of SEC baseball previews. Brian covers the Tennessee Vols, who had quite the season a year ago. They were ranked number two in D1 Baseball's poll coming in. Lots to talk about. Lots of faces gone, but lots of capable new ones in their places. Should be another exciting season in Knoxville. Brian, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Chris. Okay, let's start with the pitching. I usually start with the hitting, but I thought in all the – the noise around Tennessee's team a year ago. I thought that the biggest story was that pitching staff. You had three guys that were all SEC caliber in the rotation. You had the, the best pitcher in the league uh, and Chase Dolander, in my opinion, and the opinion of many other people. And that, that staff last year, Brian, allowed in SEC games a full half base runner less <laughs> than the number two staff in the league, which I don't remember where that ended up. The Vols start this year with, with Dolander, with Burns, with Beam, with a couple of bullpen guys back, Connell and Sechrist in the, the weekday spot. I mean, just all kinds of pitching depth for Tennessee again this year. Yeah, and you've got guys who are going to have to see major innings out of the bullpen, like Missouri transfer Seth Halverson, who was a Friday night starter in 2021 at Missouri, transferred in last year, but due to injury, didn't play, didn't pitch, couldn't, and wanted to return because he wanted to be part of something special where he could actually play. So yeah. he's probably going to be seeing a lot of bullpen action coming out of the bullpen. And and you don't, you don't know if there's an injury. If one of the starters has to be shut down for a bit, he could probably fill in there and take one of those spots. Then you've got the midweek guy who has been pretty dependable and – there's just been no place for him to move up. Xander Seacrest, who's pitched a lot of innings and started every midweek game. And so you've got him back, but yet there's nowhere for him to go in the weekend rotation. And coming out of the bullpen, you've got Zach Evans, or uh, excuse me, Wyatt Evans. And you have Zach Joyce, the brother of Ben Joyce, who everyone knows from last year had the uh, flame throwing 104 mile an hour heater. That was yeah. the talk of not only college baseball, but all of baseball, Major League Baseball, which yeah. is incredible. And you've got his brother. Hopefully the fan base understands that he's not going to be his brother exactly. That, But I still think with Frank Anderson, he's going to be a pretty good pitcher, and he's going to be very dependable. And you've got a lot of depth there. You also have, and this is big, returning who could have left last year, you've got Camden Sewell, who was a spot starter and started in tournament games in the SEC tournament and was noted for having two solid alleys against Florida, who, and he shut them down two years in a row in that spot in Hoover. So he's back. And so he could, he also could come out of the bullpen and he also could start. So you've got so much, you, you could really get through several games without anybody having to without any pure bullpen pitchers having to pitch, you could bring in another starter to close out the game, maybe two to get through. You got a starting the pitcher that if you want to save him for later, you could maybe use him for five innings and then use Howerson for two and maybe, maybe a, a Joyce or a, a Sewell for two. So it just, there's so many options of what Frank can do and what Tony Vitello can do at that position. Yeah, no doubt about it. I think the question with Tennessee a year ago, Brian, was health. You saw Dolaner miss a couple starts, although I think some of that was getting hit by a line drive. Uh, you saw Burns, I think, get his innings limited a little bit. Certainly Beam did at end of season. How were they health-wise coming into the season? I think they're all pretty much good and ready to go, and I think that's what having a Halverson and a Camden Sewell coming back. Camden Sewell coming back is just tremendously huge. I think yeah. that can take your pitching staff – to be very good, to be one that could actually push them over to where they could win you a national championship because Sewell can start. If somebody goes down, he could slide in there and start in a weekend game. Or Halverson could also start. He was a Friday night starter for Missouri. So mm -hmm. think about it. Two years ago, he goes from a Friday night starter to comes to Tennessee and there's really almost no room, but he wants to, he wants to be developed by the best. And even if he doesn't get as much innings here, that could also pay off for him long run in, as far as having a professional career to have worked under Frank Anderson, because that's what, that's what he does. 
Offense, uh, Tennessee's bats were the talk of the league a year ago. Uh, they lose their top eight guys in at bats, but a lot of guys, Brian, who played part time a year ago, who, who did great things when they played. Uh, Jared Dickey comes to mind. Certainly, Blake Burke comes to mind, who hit 14 home runs and 96 at bats. They get Zane Denton from Alabama, who was Alabama starting third baseman, Griffin Merritt. And left was player of the year at Cincinnati in the American Conference or American Athletic. Um, they got Kyle Booker back, who was supposed to be a, a big guy for them a year ago. Christian Moore, who put up some really good numbers. This is a lineup. I don't know if it'll be last year's, but certainly these guys, when they played, and, and some of these guys, um, I knew I was forgetting someone. Maui Ahuna from Kansas, the shortstop, who was on Team USA. All these guys have produced – in previous time, other than maybe Charlie Taylor, their catcher. Now, some of them have, have been in full-time roles, some of them in part-time, but you look at the slugging and all base percentages and, and the home run numbers up and down the lineup, um, and it's been something so far. Yeah, most teams, when they replace their entire lineup like Tennessee has when it flips, they have to rely on guys that maybe are freshmen or sophomores that haven't really – had a whole lot of experience other than maybe midweek games against your Tennessee techs and your mid majors of the world. But these guys returning up all had, as you say, a lot of experience playing some starting and some three of them, a third of their lineup could be a, a key spot for other schools last year that played all the time. As you mentioned, yeah. Zane Ditton is from the mid state and he comes back from Alabama to Tennessee where he he could play third base and he could flip with with Griffin Merritt, who was the American Athletic Conference Player of the Year at Cincinnati, who who um, who transferred in and he Merritt is one of those kids that just has a tremendous the ball just explodes off his bat and another guy to look out for that maybe that hasn't really played much but he can also hit he can hit moonshots is the DH who could play um, – he could play DH. That's uh, Caveras Tears. It's, uh, his last name is pronounced Tears, but it's spelled Tears, T-E-A-R-S. And from what I hear, he might be putting some tears on the face of a lot of opposing pitchers <laughs> if he gets his way. And he could be the DH with – he could slide into that spot for Blake Burke, who was the DH for most of the most of the games last year. Blake Burke could play first base now – Blake was thought of to be an outfielder, but the outfielder is crowded. I think athletic-wise, he probably is more fit to play first than in the outfield. Yeah. So he looks to be the everyday first baseman, and he'll slide over from DH, and then you could have uh, tears, and maybe Ryan Miller fill the uh, DH role on this team and bat eight, probably in the eighth spot, which is where most well, of their DHs have been. Yeah. I was going to say, one trademark of their lineup a year ago is they had depth. I, I know Dickey started the year in the lineup, I think, and left, went down, ended up between health and maybe other guys producing. Wasn't a full-timer at the end of the year. You, you saw Burke seize the job part-time here and there. Uh, Kyle Booker was a guy going into last season that I, I think they were high on. Just didn't work out. Other guys see spots ahead of them. But they've got – I don't remember if we mentioned Dylan Dryling. Coldly back as some other guys that have been coming up in, in the previews have been reading in D1 and Baseball America and some other places. But what I'm getting at, Tennessee had depth last year. They had a lot of guys on the bench who could really hit. And it kind of looks like it's that same type of team this year, too. Yeah. And Kyle Booker is a kid that has been there for a couple of years and he played extensively in 2021. And he looks to be in center field and he could also platoon with Christian Scott. Another outfielder, Christian Moore, who played left field, could slide over to second base and be the second baseman. So it looks like they're going to move some guys from outfield to the infield. But Cal Booker is one kid that uh, doesn't seem to have the type of he's, – he's probably perfect for a center field, but he was stuck behind Drew Gilbert for all those – for two years, and there just wasn't an opportunity except – pinch hit late in games sometimes and then come on as a defensive replacement. And then Christian Scott, who is a fifth year senior, I believe, who could have but wanted to come back. I guess he he's taking advantage of the COVID. I guess each player that was here during the COVID gets another year. So it looks like Christian Scott's gonna take care of that and come in and probably 
be counted on to, to play, especially on maybe a Sunday or something. And he could be a late inning replacement as well. He's a kid that just wants to, to be a part of a team and is content to play his role. He's not someone who cares about, you know, playing all the time. He wants to go and wants to do and come in when he's needed. And so he's pretty much per- perfect for that role. And he's, he's an in-state kid, so it means a lot to him. Brian, a look at the schedule. I think they head out west uh, to start the year. They've got, what, Arizona, Grand Canyon, San Diego. If I read the schedule correctly, they've got a season um, or weekend series. What is it, March 3rd, uh, starting then against Gonzaga, which has been a pretty good program from time to time. Uh, then they get in the SEC. Everybody but Ar- – excuse me, I guess they catch everybody but, what, Alabama, Auburn, and, and Ole Miss – not an easy schedule. Uh, that that LSU series is the one that a lot of people are circling is is maybe the national series of the year. Tony Vitello gets a road trip back to Arkansas, uh, where he had been an assistant to Dave Van Horn, and of course at Missouri, where I believe he went to school. So it's an interesting schedule. It will be interesting to see how the Vols handle that as kind of the team with the the target on its back from day one, other than last year where Tennessee went into the season where well, we didn't quite know what we were getting and and. Uh, by, by April, it was evident what it <laughs> well, was. But that between that schedule and between being a little bit of a, a marked man this year, uh, given the the fifty seven and nine record last year, it's going to be very interesting. What is kind of the thing to note is that last year they didn't start out ranked as high as they are this year. They are yeah. already number two, whereas last year they started way down in some polls and were foolishly. Some had them not even in the in the top thirty, and yet they were ascended yeah. to number one really quickly, as they were number one by the end of March and held that spot for, you know, a long time. And they're going to come in. Baseball America's got LSU, Tennessee, Florida, all in the top three, one, two, three, and they've got Vanderbilt six, Texas A and M seven, and Ole Miss mm-hmm. ten. So you've got six of the top six of the top ten in the league from the SEC and the balls will get every single one of those with the exception of 10th ranked Ole Miss on the schedule. Yep. And A&M comes in. The first series is going to be probably, I don't know if it's going to be much of a challenge from a competition standpoint, but the biggest competition at Missouri in mid March might be the weather. Yeah. It could be, it could <laughs> <Yeah>. be 45 <laughs> degrees there when they play. Now, oh, if they're lucky, <laughs> yeah, they're going to get to go to play in Arizona, which is going to they they expect maybe seventy five and sunny, and then they'll have to start the season, the SEC season, in a uh, much colder. Potentially, you now you never know. The weather could be nice and break, and but it could potentially be not very comfortable. It's like it's not very comfortable in in Knoxville at that time. Sometimes in March, there was there. I think there was one series last year in around March, uh, March the 12th or something, where there were five inches of snow on the ground. game got snowed out. Oh, goodness. So, yeah. you know, a, a team came down here from Rhode Island thinking they were going to come and play in warm weather, and th- the game gets snowed out. There's six inches of snow on the ground. So they were like, okay, well, <laughs> that's obviously – we need to go a lot further south <laughs> if we're going to get yeah. out of the weather. <laughs> Not far south enough. So then the LSU – is the last uh, the last series the third series of the year is, is at LSU and I wish that series was late was like end of April instead of end of March I think that one is need they need to have yeah. a uh, that needs to have some build up to it and then they go to Arkansas in uh, they go to Arkansas in mid April which it's too bad the two teams couldn't have played last year that's a shame they should play every year given given what's the history between Vitello and and coach Van Horn. And then obviously you've got Vanderbilt yeah. coming in after that. That's going to be, you know, Vandy. I don't know if they're on a downswing, but I still think that that team is top 20, top 15. Good. So that's going to have a lot of, there's going to be a lot of heated, uh, bad blood in that series as well. No doubt. As Vandy, Vandy wants to take back the, the mantra they've had for so long. They're just not going to want to keep, let Tennessee have the baton as being the best program in the state. They want to, they want to get that back. And then it looks like that the schedule sort of lightens up after that, as I think Georgia is expected to be a little bit down. Uh, Kentucky is Kentucky. And then South Carolina has sort of been in transition for a while, a proud program that has fallen on tough times recently. And so it looks like the back end of the SEC schedule is a little bit. And then I forgot to mention Mississippi state, 
they yeah. um they're they're coming in that I don't know if they're I expect them to be improved but that series is at Lindsey Nelson Stadium and that uh, I think they've signed a lot of I think they went into the portal and got a lot of guys that's going to make them a lot better from the start so that might be a challenge yeah I didn't realize this till we're doing it I'm looking at the schedule they have got five programs that are ranked in the top 10 by one of the major polls back-to-back weekends A&M at LSU Florida at Arkansas Vandy in in that order in the schedule that is I, I've seen some crazy stuff in the SEC because it is a brutal league I don't know that I've ever seen that yeah and it's I think a lot of SEC teams I don't think they're going to feel sorry for Tennessee because they have the same exact type schedule set up where they're going to be facing yeah three or four top 10 teams in a row themselves. And that's, uh, you know, that's, that's three, I guess three of those teams are in the East, three of those teams in the West, you go down a little bit and you've got Arkansas at, at number 11. So you've got seven of the first 11 ranked in the SEC and, and Tennessee plays five of those other teams that are top 11 or better in this poll. And yeah. you go all the way down to uh, Auburn who they don't face there. They check in at number 22 and I'm sure Auburn, loses a few players, but they're going to have a representative program as well, I expect. So, no doubt. I, I think this year, I think, of course, any time that they're going to want to get back to right what happened last year when they didn't make Omaha and they were expected to, I think that they, uh, I think anything short of Omaha will be a disappointment again. But I think if they can just get back to Omaha and hopefully if they can win a couple games, I think that would be considered a tremendous success. Yeah, usually is for most programs, but the bar was certainly set high a year ago. And if you uh, keep going to Omaha, you're going to eventually, I think you'll eventually win win it all if you can keep going enough. Unless you're Florida State. but um, Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, other than those guys, yes, I think you're right. Um, hey, you uh, you're doing some – writing for us and basketball on the site. We really appreciate that. You and Tony Basilio are two of my favorite people in sports media. You're both friends of mine. Tell folks where they can find your work uh, up in Knoxville and beyond. Well, we're on every day on uh, FM and AM. We're on FM. We're on AM 1040 and FM 99.7. And we're also on the Tony Basilio networks, Tony Basilio.com Monday through Friday. And we are also every Every after uh, every football season's over, but we have a Garza Law Firm fifth quarter, we call it, after every football game that goes at least three hours beyond. And then basketball, we have the basketball overtime, which is also presented by the Marcus Garza Law Firm after every basketball game. And we're also going to do some things with baseball. So stay tuned. I don't know how much if, uh, if that includes probably – it might just include – maybe after Sunday, after the weekend series and the regular season. I don't know that there'll be, unless something really extraordinary happens, I don't think they'll, I don't know if we'll be on after every game, but we'll be on after some games during the regular season, and we'll probably be on definitely after every postseason game. So stay tuned, but that's that's way on down the line. Hopefully they can um, get some more games at Lindsey Nelson Stadium and get back and avenge what happened last year. I appreciate you having me. Is there anything, anything else? Oh, uh, any time. Hey, Brian. No, I, th- I think we're good. I'm sure we'll have you on again during baseball season. Always a lot to talk about in Knoxville during baseball season. Um, and look forward to getting your perspective on that. Uh, thank you. Well, thank uh, you. So God much. bless you and Tony. Thank you, and we look forward and, to doing uh, more. We'll, we'll catch you soon. And we'll talk. No, next no week. doubt. We'll All right, a basketball team for Tennessee and Vandy play basketball. No, no doubt. Uh, having a little for the, for the listeners at home, having a little bit of audio overlap here. But anyway, um, he is Brian Hartman of the Tony o, Tony Basilio Show. I'm Chris Lee of Southeastern 14. Thanks for watching. We're going to be previewing all the SEC teams for this baseball season. So be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, catch all that. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.